Hello and a very warm welcome to the first What Works of 2021. Uh, today's discussion will be around ID's report, which was published in August 2020, which evaluated ADB's energy policy and program from 2009 to 2019. All of you would agree that for a country's economy to flourish, access to energy that is sufficient, efficient, secure, equitable, and environmentally and financially sustainable is absolutely crucial. So much progress has been made in improving access to electricity in Asia and the Pacific region. Even so, having said that, energy reliability and sustainability need to improve. While total energy supply and demand in the region has uh, more than doubled since 2000, the primary energy mix has not changed significantly. And it is still heavily reliant on coal and crude oil, affecting the long run sustainability of energy systems. So in this context, this sector evaluation of Asian Development Bank's energy policy 2009 provides what would, uh, many would agree is a timely input to the formulation of a new energy policy and the ongoing sector transformation. And today's discussion will be around the key findings and recommendations of this report. For that, to give you a brief insight and an overview of this evaluation, I'd like to call upon the co-team leader of this evaluation, Alfredo, to come and make his presentation. Alfredo. Hi, hi, Saleha. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everyone, wherever you are located these days. Uh, we have prepared a very brief uh, presentation to introduce this panel. We have five key messages from this presentation. Uh, firstly, ADB has been the leading development partner in energy sectors on, of most DMCs in, in developing Asia, not only in volume, but also in terms of policy dialogue and partner coordination. Also, energy sector was, the best, was one of the best performing sectors in ADB, achieving 81% uh, rate uh, success rate in, um, in the last decade, from 2009 to 2019, which was the evaluation period. The energy program made significant contributions, mostly to increasing availability and reliability of power supply. However, I fell short in a few uh, priorities outlined in the policy, which were demand size efficiency, uh, last mile electrification sector reforms. In terms of ADB's institutional structure and its human resources, there they've been found they were largely adequate to support the program. Nevertheless, uh, some improvements are needed to address cross-sector interventions. Uh, regarding the energy policy 2009, it has been considered relevant during the evaluation period. However, it's no longer suited to deal with the ongoing sector transformation that started a few years ago. Uh, ADB's new institutional priorities reflected in study 2030, the current global consensus on climate change, and in particular, the use of coal as an energy source. So more in detail, we'll touch upon these uh, five uh, sections. We'll start with um, uh, a brief description of ADB energy sector systems. Basically, ADB um, financed $42.5 billion uh, during 2009 2019 to support the sector. It was the second largest after transport. Uh, of this uh, $42.5 billion, 75% were sovereign lending to governments, whereas 25% was uh, non sovereign to private sector um, companies to develop energy sector in, in DMCs. As you can see in the graph beside, um, electricity and transmission, transmission distribution was the largest and dominant sector with about 40% of total lending. It was uh, followed by conventional and renewable energy generation. Uh, and in terms of, of regions, South Asia and Central West uh, Asia regions were the largest, and India in particular was the largest borrower with 18% of the total. And it was followed closely by Pakistan, PRC, Indonesia, and Bangladesh in that order. Regarding performance, um, as mentioned, the energy sector averaged 81% success rate over the evaluation period, outperforming ADB average and being one of the best performing sectors. Uh, Non-sovereign operations perform even better than that success rate. Um, one of the reasons is that power generation projects were the most successful because of their characteristics in terms of large tanky projects and many which were privately sponsored. However, sector development and institutional reform was a subsector with less, less success mostly because states facing political economy and legacy issues. Regarding results, the energy program was critical, again, in expanding and enhancing electricity supply, uh, mostly through large investments in power grid infrastructure, and also an increasing share of renewable energies in the region, being ADB one of the groundbreakers in, in, this, in this sense in many DMCs. 
And, but however, the program paid insufficient attention to access to energy for all uh, through new electricity connections or modern cooking, uh, demand side energy efficiency, energy sector reforms and improved governance, regional cooperation and increased resilience and climate proofing for energy infrastructure. Regarding organization for delivery and how ADB uh, supported the sector, we found that uh, ADB energy staff increased by almost half during the period with a significant increase in the share of female staff as well as some decentralization to resident missions. And the so-called one ADB approach has not yet been fully operationalized in the energy sector and also some others, although there have been recent improvements and collaboration across departments and divisions. ADB's transition to a knowledge bank remains a work in progress in the energy and other sectors as well. Knowledge creation is not that well disseminated across or outside the organization, uh, while the ongoing sector transformation requires massive innovation efforts. Uh, finally, the institutional approval culture has implications on project performance. However, there have been recent changes in project accounting, introduced readiness filters, and some performance indicators that may improve this situation. Regarding the assessment of the 2009 energy policy, the main findings are that the energy policy was indeed relevant, and its three objectives align well with the needs of the DMCs at the time, strategy 2020, the policies of other MDBs, and the climate change priorities Again, talking about 2008, 2009, when it was prepared. Now, the policy objectives address the main needs of the DMCs, such as the three of them were renewable energy and energy efficiency, uh, universal access to energy, and an efficient and financially viable energy sector. However, the policy's implementation guidance was a bit general, not useful enough as a framework for project selection. In fact, only one indicator had an investment target of clean energy. Uh, also, there is a disconnect between what the, formally, what the policy formally allowed in terms of um, and what ADB finally financed in practice since 2013 regarding the use of coal as an energy source. Uh, the current policy is no longer adequately aligned with the global consensus on climate change, particularly after Paris Agreement in 2015. Some recent changes in the energy sector DMCs, the transformation of the energy sector globally, and the new ADB's strategy 2030. To finalize, uh, the, the evaluation gave five recommendations, two of them are strategic. The first one, ADB should revisit and update the energy policy by emphasizing climate change mitigation and adaptation as a core priority. Particularly, withdrawing from financing new added capacity of coal-fired power and heat generation plants. Also supporting DMCs to phase out coal-based energy in order to mitigate their environmental and health impacts in the exist of the existing coal fleet and as well as introducing a sound screening criteria for other fossil fuels, particularly natural gas. Um, ADB should also place more emphasis on promoting a more active high-level engagement with DMCs in the energy sectors in order to help countries prepare the long-term sector plans. Also support DMC uh, climate commitments and priorities, especially in the aftermath of the ongoing coronavirus disease pandemic crisis, promote establishment of adequate, uh, adequate institutional arrangements to build financially viable energy systems and expand regional integration as well. Regarding the last three recommendations, which are operational and organizational, ADB should increase support to address gaps in ADB energy operations in some key areas, which include sector reforms, demand side energy efficiency, as mentioned before, distribution network enhancement, renewable energy integration to improve long-term sustainability of, AD, of DMC energy systems. Another recommendation uh, supports the uh, ADB to expand energy operations beyond the power sector into cross-sectoral applications in order to meet the new energy needs of DMCs and also incentivize the staff to work across sectors and divisions. The final recommendation says that ADB should increase the attention paid to knowledge creation and dissemination, innovation work, as well as cross-sectoral and enhancing quality and entry by revisiting incentive structures of staff and by strengthening internal and external collaboration channels. Thank you for your attention. This has been the key findings of the, of the evaluation. Thank you very much again. Over to you, Sadafa. Thank you, Alfredo. That was uh, the co-team leader of this evaluation, Alfredo Banolea. At this point, I'd like to let you all know that both Alfredo and the co-team leader of this evaluation, Shireen Ibrahim, are going to be available. So in the designated question and answer session, which will follow up the panel discussion, please feel free to ask them questions. Of course, you can ask the panelists as well. And just to let you know that there's a question and answer box where you can put in your questions. You could also put on, turn on your video, identify yourself and ask the questions as well. 
Um, and a couple of other quick announcements I've been asked to make that uh, when I introduce the panelists, please turn on your videos at that point as well. Um, and uh, today, uh, unlike other times, we have a couple of external attendees as well. Um, so that's a bit of a departure from uh, our regular practice, but just to let you know that there are a couple of external uh, people as well attending this um, seminar. Uh, now, let me quickly introduce you to the panelists. Uh, we have uh, Edie Chris Pandey. Uh, we have uh, Kenichi Yokoyama. He's DG Sard. Uh, Yongping Zai, Chief Energy Sector Group, SDCC. And Preeti Bhandari, Chief uh, Climate Change and Disaster Risk Management. And uh, moderating today's session is DG IED, Marvin Taylor Dotman. So Marvin, it's over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Saleha. Uh, thank you very much uh, uh, to Alfredo and Shireen and to Director Sobramanian for a very good and insightful uh, report that uh, is the basis for this uh, conversation. And obviously, thank you very much to the excellent panelists that are joining us this morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever uh, you are. The plan uh, for this session is to have a conversation on the subject of uh, energy, on the one hand, the energy program, and on the other, on the policy uh, itself. Uh, and we're gonna have this conversation in two parts. We we'll look at the past 10 years uh, and what the bank has learned um, what has worked, what has not worked, and why. And here are the opinions of the experts here of, uh, represented in this panel. And then we will talk a bit about the future, what has to be done for this to work better uh, going forward. So we have a great uh, set of panelists here uh, that bring a lot of uh, knowledge and perspective uh, on this subject. Let me first uh, start with DG. Uh, if you have been working for a good number of uh, years in uh, Southeast, uh, in, in South Asia, uh, particularly a long experience in India. Uh, can you give us a feeling of how the needs of uh, this region, South Asia, has evolved uh, over the years and how the bank has tried to uh, meet uh, these needs of, uh, of uh, the region, what successes uh, can you uh, uh, talk uh, about? Uh, what has the bank learned uh, over these past years of operating in the Southeast, South, South Asia region? Uh, yeah, thank you for this opportunity to join. First of all, on behalf of uh, Saad, I thank you for this very good uh, evaluation, giving us a lot of uh, uh, you know, uh, future directions. Uh, with this, uh, I first uh, would like to respond to your question by saying that, uh, you know, South Asia uh, sectoral needs were uh, quite consistent with what was stipulated in the, the 2009 energy policy. So uh, the needs were there in terms of capacity expansion, in terms of uh, generation, uh, transmission, uh, distribution, as well as uh, rapidly expanding the access and uh, incorporating renewable energy. So overall, over the last 10 years, I would say that uh, the sector has seen a significant development uh, meeting the needs. And uh, in the meantime, uh, ADB has uh, been substantially providing its uh, own finance uh, to support this process. And uh, then we he performed and contributed to significantly. Of course, we uh, faced uh, challenges as uh, reflected in, in the evaluation report. Overall, I think about uh, back in 2010, uh, you know, there's lots of, uh, you know, story media uh, talking about, uh, you know, chronic uh, power shortage affecting the industrial development of the South Asian uh, countries. But over the years, the, uh, this uh, generation uh, capacity shortage issue is, uh, at least at this moment, uh, is, is gone. And uh, uh, I've seen a substantial increase. I think in case of India, generation capacity per se 
uh, increased by 150% over these years. Uh, so, uh, and in the meantime, uh, this uh, significant capacity expansion was also led by renewable energy generation and uh, uh, 100 gigawatt almost uh, India has uh, been achieving. And uh, in the meantime, access uh, also rapidly expanded, uh, at least in official statistics uh, say that 100% villages are free e e covered and a substantial part of the uh, villagers also cover at 70, 80, or even 90%. Uh, so there's been a, a significant improvement uh, uh, and uh, ADB in the meantime provided, I think almost one third of, at some stage, third of our South Asia's finance went to energy sector. Uh, and also PSOD side also, almost half of the uh, annual lending to India reaching like uh, 70, 80, 100 million dollars per year also went to renewable energy. Uh, so we, we contributed uh, quite a lot and uh, uh, of course uh, not without challenges. Overall, as the report suggested, we, we know that the success rate of energy sector was uh, very good. Uh, because of, you know, the, 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 the nature of the sector, uh, it is uh, that way, like, you know, large scale contract and a bigger uh, contractor come in and, and provide, uh, you know, infrastructure. Uh, and, uh, uh, but uh, on the other hand, we see, we saw tremendous challenges in terms of the implementation capacity, particularly the lower income states and uh, hilly states uh, of India, where they have a uh, lots of issues like environment, you know, forest clearance, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, so I think ADB's contribution also is also given on in terms of a capacity building. And the uh, report says that uh, we have uh, relatively you know, less uh, contribution on the sector reforms. Uh, but uh, as far as India is concerned, uh, you know, we, we have one uh, PBR, uh, which is provided to Punjab uh, as the, the part of the PSM uh, reform loan. But at the same time, most of the uh, sector projects included covenants for the uh, financial uh, you know, performance of the uh, transmission distribution companies. And uh, I would say I, I checked up the uh, rating of the, those uh, you know, company performance and most of the states that the ADB has engaged is rated above average. So I, I think in that sense, uh, our contribution has also been there. Of course, uh, definitely as compared with other, other regions, our, our contribution on the uh, P, uh, policy, uh, I mean, PBR is, 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 is less. But in the meantime, uh, we also faced, uh, you know, the changes mm -hmm. over the uh, sectoral environment. Uh, you know, while we are working, the more and more uh, our counterparts is uh, having, you know, uh, access to the private capital market. So mm -hmm. our sovereign lending demand is getting less for the straightforward uh, types of investments for, for the, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the transmission uh, and, and so on and so forth. And also the generation capacity has been more or less uh, met. So I think the sector is also now facing more to you know supporting the integration of renewable energy to the system itself rather than you know the infrastructure capacity expansion uh, so and i i think i can cover in the next round but uh, uh, you know uh, we are really seeing the change uh, you know for the evolution of the sectoral needs and uh, this evaluation report is, is providing a very good uh, directions uh, how we move forward so thank you Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for that, that perspective of uh, the South uh, Asia region uh, and the contribution of the bank uh, to that transformation that you're talking about. Um, it, Yongping, you, you, you look at the theme as a whole in the, in the institution. Uh, from what you heard uh, that, that uh, Digi Kenichi's uh, talk, is that, does that have a similar uh, resonance in the rest of uh, the region, uh, the rest of uh, South Asia Pacific region? Are there differences by some regions in which the bank struggled to contribute? What challenges can you uh, talk about the bank face over the last past year in implementing the energy program? And what successes can the bank claim that uh, contributed to over this period? 
Yes, thank you, uh, DG Marvin. I, first of all, I join uh, DG uh, Kenichi for thanking IED for producing and your team for producing this uh, excellent report, which highlighted the success. But those are the challenges of, uh, of uh, our operations in the energy sector. As far as uh, uh, you know, my work is concerned, I would like to give credit to those people who are attending this uh, uh, meeting. Actually, I'm impressed with number of participants today, over 100, 200 actually. Uh, that actually most of, many of these uh, uh, participants are uh, staff working in the energy sector, they have contributed to the success of our energy uh, operations. 10 years ago, when uh, actually when uh, uh, DG Kanichi mentioned 10 years ago, India, actually India is a good example of how ADB played its role. It's a typical role when 10 years ago, uh, uh, the overall Asia's uh, uh, electrification rate is, is, like, is slightly above 80%. And today, the electrification rate is 96%, 94% precisely. So that ADB actually cannot claim all of this, but we contributed to this uh, success in uh, extending electricity access uh, to people. And we are actually uh, providing half of our lending. Over 10 years, our lending is about uh, $40 billion plus in energy sector. Half of this 20 billion is in transmission distribution sector. So this TND project are mostly meant for extending the grid to cover, to provide electricity access to, uh, to people in, the, in our DMCs. In addition, we also realized that uh, uh, just TND would not reach the remote areas, would not reach uh, the island states where the uh, uh, population also require electricity access. So, Renewable energy, off-grid renewable energy has become also important part of our operations. Again, 10 years ago, when ADB launched our solar uh, energy initiative, uh, we had the objective of uh, uh, facilitating three gigawatt of solar power within three years. At that time, people said that was myself, including saying that this is very challenging because uh, solar was expensive, uh, when we started at that time, the solar uh, park project in uh, Gujarat, uh, the Charanka uh, solar park, the bid result was almost 15 rupees per kilowatt hour for the uh, offtake. And today the bid result in India typically is two, three rupees. So we can also ADB claim that we contributed to the success of uh, deploying renewable energy in Asia. We can cite this example in many other countries. Sri Lanka is close to 100%, many other countries, Bangladesh, Southeast Asia, and we also finance the wind power in many countries. I must highlight the role played by uh, PSOD, as uh, DG Ken has just mentioned. PSOD is increasingly taking over the role of financing renewable energy generation as public sector, ourselves, uh, our RDs, would play important role in continuing playing a role in extending, uh, strengthening the grid, including the national grid, but also the off-grid in remote areas. So I think uh, in all these areas, ADB can, can say that we made good contribution and it's been recognized by uh, IED's evaluation and thanks to the effort of uh, our staff uh, in different departments, including uh, the five RDs and also PSOD. So that I would like to start with. But of course, the challenges as uh, IED has mentioned, I can talk in the second round on how to move forward with energy efficiency, with last mile uh, energy access, not only for electricity, but also for clean cooking, but also heating. And also the sector reform, I would like to perhaps go to more details in the second round. Thank you, thank you very much, Jinping. Excellent uh, for that broader broader perspective. Let's go now to a more specific uh, perspective. Uh, uh, this the perspective of climate climate change. Now, uh, you know, ask uh, Preeti, uh, responsible for climate change operations of uh, the institution. Uh, of course, uh, the the bulk of uh, climate change uh, uh, operations 
uh, come from energy precisely, right? Through renewable, through energy efficiency. Uh, in what way can you uh, describe the contribution of uh, the energy program uh, to the objective of our climate change of uh, the institution? And, and uh, particularly both on uh, mitigation, adaptation, uh, and what challenges have you seen uh, in the past uh, 10 years that the institution have been facing to achieve these objectives? Thank you, Marvin. And um, thank you for also uh, setting us on course with the evaluation of the energy sector. And later this year, you would also be uh, presenting the evaluation of the climate operations. So I think the energy sector review would feed in uh, significantly to to the climate change operations review as well. And we are look, looking forward to, to that report by IED as well. And uh, you very rightly said that, you know, energy sector uh, in the past uh, has contributed significantly to the mitigation objectives uh, uh, of not only our countries, but of ADB. And Yongping talked about you know, uh, starting at 2009, but I think it was as early as 2005 when ADB was, uh, I think, very progressive in announcing that we'll do 1 billion in clean energy investments as part of the energy efficiency initiative. And 2009, it was doubled to, you know, 2 billion. So that I, uh, in itself was very uh, forward looking uh, by, uh, by our organization to set that kind of a target to put us on course uh, uh, for addressing climate change uh, uh, and you know contribution of our countries to the to the problem. Uh, you recognize very well Asia's large footprint on this issue. So in terms of achievements, uh, that very clear pronunciation of of a target for clean energy was important. And I must say over the years, uh, you know, uh, the role that the private sector has played as uh, both Ken and Yongping have highlighted at one point in time, or even now, uh, the private sector operations are contributing to as much as one third of what we are doing as climate finance in the energy sector. So, so the, this seized the opportunity and it was, uh, it was a very welcome development insofar as uh, ADB's contribution or assistance to our countries go. Uh, the third important point in terms of achievements was you, our energy sector kept in step with how the climate discourse was developing uh, in terms of you know, what constitutes mitigation. Because at one point in time, clean ed energy included greenfield natural gas. And uh, when the MDBs you know, uh, sat together to develop a methodology for what constitutes climate finance and what constitutes mitigation finance, uh, greenfield natural gas was ruled out. So, you know, uh, and then we, we brought that merger between climate and energy uh, typology and methodology. So those, in terms of achievements, those three are, you know, big achievements in terms of target setting, in terms of getting private sector involved and keeping in step with the evolving discourse on climate. Uh, but that was not without challenges. Uh, I may say the target setting, uh, be it related to energy sector or the climate target that we'd set out uh, in 2015 of doubling our climate finance uh, by 2020, uh, while it did put the institution in the right direction, it also led to some kind of an obsession on metrics, the inputs. Uh, and I think we are now in that phase where we have started talking about impacts of our investments rather than, you know, what we have achieved in terms of dollar numbers. And that challenge, I think, was there in the last 10 years. And that is what we have to overcome in the coming decade if we really have to make a difference to move from input metrics to output and impact metrics. Uh, the second one, uh, again, as Ken said, you know, there was a shortage of energy supplies. So uh, there was a predominance of supply side investments, be it TND or generation investments. Uh, to the extent that energy efficiency and demand side uh, took, a, took a back seat. And that's where I think there was possible possibly a lost opportunity, not only 
in looking at the supply side options, uh, uh, demand side options, but also looking at other sectors that could contribute uh, to our energy sector operations, you know, be it uh, uh, green housing, uh, uh, green buildings, or uh, be it related to uh, uh, investments in the industrial sector. So, so those were, you know, sectors deliberately or not, uh, uh, not addressed and, and the horizontal cross sectoral, you know, view of energy uh, probably uh, uh, was missed. Uh, it could be due to our overall envelope of investments that did not allow it, but it was an important opportunity. And as you know, energy efficiency uh, and uh, the relevance of energy efficiency has been um, um, in the public discussion for a long time. So with our limited financing, if uh, we could have come up with models to, to build energy efficiency portfolio, uh, that would have been um, a great achievement. And uh, the last one in terms of challenges, yes, again, you know, uh, like the rest of the globe, uh, everyone understands mitigation very well, but we do not understand adaptation and resilience. So to what extent are we making our infrastructure resilient to future impacts of climate change is important. And since 2014, of course, uh, ADB has instituted a mandatory climate risk screening to ensure that our investments are, uh, are meeting certain standards of resilience, but this is an area related to the energy sector that we have to build on uh, moving forward as well, and which has had a slow beginning in the in the last 10 years. I'll stop here and happy to take more questions in the second round. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Preeti. That very uh, compressed perspective uh, in, in already anticipating some of the areas that the bank uh, can address uh, going forward, but we'll have a conversation about this in a, in a moment. Uh, let us now hear from a uh, perspective coming from the board, uh, Iri Pande. Um, you, you, let, let's, talk, let's talk your own perspective, right? It's not the board itself, right? I know that, I'm sure you were going to clarify this, right? About, at the, a perspective of our board member. Right? Yes, uh, thank you very so, much, Marvin. Uh, I can, I am quite creative and imaginative, but uh, attempting to summarize all the perspectives of all board members might be, might even challenge my <laughs> capacity. Uh, and I also would not do it justice. So uh, I'll just start out with my, my simple remarks, which is to begin by thanking you and your team for the kind invitation to participate in this panel. Uh, I think I've said this already, this is a very valuable series of events, and I'm very pleased to be involved. Uh, I also want to thank, to thank the greater or broader IED and all the contributors for this very valuable and useful report, uh, which is uh, something that many of my constituents were awaiting with great anticipation. Uh, we've heard from colleagues and, and uh, the, the uh, co-leader described the efforts uh, that have, and the results. Uh, I'd like to offer my congratulations to all members of the bank past and present who contributed to these results. Uh, and of course, I would be remiss if I did not thank my fellow panelists uh, who have uh, clearly in the context of a relatively brief period uh, demonstrated the level of expertise and dedication uh, that helped the bank deliver on its mandate. Uh, Kenichi and Yongping have given a very clear sense of the efforts involved and Preeti was articulate as ever about the challenges that remain. To sort of step back, I think it's clear results like these do not happen by accident and it is important to take note of these successes and give credit where it is due. Uh, however, I would not be fulfilling my mandate if I did not also uh, consider what did not or has not happened and where the bank can and should or must improve its performance. I won't go into the, uh, the details of the evaluation, but there were a number of areas where the program fell short. I don't think that is really a matter for much debate. If I were to be a bit provocative, uh, I would ask um, whether the shortcomings identified by the report are, are not just really uh, the flip side of our successes 
that we established ourselves and our competences in certain areas, had success, and then proceeded to bang out projects in a bit of a cookie cutter manner and declined or were unable to push ourselves or our clients in other areas that have become uh, increasingly important. Uh, I know that colleagues will be familiar with the old saying that to a man or woman with a, ham with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And perhaps we followed the path of least resistance uh, and fell victim to some of our successes. The energy sector, it's a bit of a truism, but it's clearly having to deal with incredible change uh, brought about by rapid uh, technological advances and pressing climate change concerns. Uh, standards and expectations have changed rapidly and what we did in the past is unlikely to be satisfactory going forward. Uh, if I were to consider the sector in the broader context of the bank's overall operations, I'd have to wonder about the effect that our largely siloed and hierarchy driven uh, business culture, the limited investment in the sharing of knowledge and the rather parsimonious approach that has been taken to the resourcing of RMs uh, has had on the sector and its results. Clearly some things were empowered and other things uh, either ignored or provided with a lower level of priority. And we need a more integrated approach to address all of the challenges and opportunities that remain. I note, however, that all three of the topics the, that I mentioned, the business culture, the sharing of knowledge and the RM uh, resourcing are now subject of major initiatives by BP, BPMSD, SDCC and SPD. So I'm very hopeful for the future. Uh, here in Asia, we must acknowledge, as I think Preeti has highlighted, must acknowledge our situation as the largest populated area on earth uh, with the largest demand for natural resources and the largest emissions of greenhouse gases. Uh, how the bank deals with this issue and supports DMCs in responding to these challenges will affect how the bank is perceived uh, and evaluated in coming years. I, I think I'll, I'll leave it at that for the moment. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Iri, Iri Pandey. Uh, we, we'll come back to you to talk more about uh, the way you see the policy uh, delivering on its expectation uh, in the past and, and, and especially going forward. Is this policy um, adequate uh, or is there something that has to be done uh, to improve the policy, which is precisely your area of, uh, 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 of responsibility, uh, but now let's let's talk. I know that there are uh, some some of the participants asking questions. They they will come soon uh, or on 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 our own uh, screen. They will be posted by by our colleagues. Um, uh, so don't worry. They, for the audience who are posting questions, they uh, will come to the attention of the panel panelists soon. Uh, let us now talk about going forward. Uh, we've talked about what has worked, what has not worked. And overall, the, the sense is that the contribution of the bank has been significant, although there are some issues that have been noted by, by you, that now we can uh, think of them, uh, this, uh, having in mind uh, the, the forward perspective. So let, let me now start with the overall view um, uh, from uh, Young Ping. So if you now look at uh, the next five to 10 uh, years, what challenges do you see uh, for uh, ADB? Uh, what things have to be uh, improved uh, in the, the uh, program that the bank will be putting uh, in place and what areas should be improved from the policy point of uh, point of view. Uh, perhaps you can start referring to a fundamental issue uh, in our, this conversation as the role of coal, especially for Asia, right? The, the most intense user of uh, coal uh, in the world uh, for energy purposes. Yongping, please. Thank you, DG Marvin. Uh, I will deal with this uh, uh, important uh, issue on coal at the later part of my uh, remarks, second round of remarks, I would like to start with the vision moving forward five, 10 years. 
what are the key challenges and needs for the region? I think IED report has highlighted some of them. We agree, management has uh, sent, it, sent re responses to you. We agree with your analysis. We believe that, uh, that there is a need to update the energy policy given that the world today compared to 10 years, 11 years ago when the, the you know, prevailing policy dated 2009 was adopted. There are a lot of changes in technologies, but more importantly, fundamentally, the world is now uh, under this uh, threat of climate change. We have Paris Agreement. We have continued the role, uh, responsibility in providing uh, uh, in poverty reduction. We have sustainable development goals. ADB then have a strategy 2030. All these guiding principles should be uh, the foundation of the new energy policy. Uh, this, we are going through a consultation process. I'm happy that even today's panel, I consider as a good forum to get inputs for our policy, uh, you know, uh, revision, updating, getting input guidance from uh, ED uh, Chris. This is important to us. And recently I did, we conducted a staff review on this same question, what are the you know, key challenges and needs for the region and what will be reflected in the new energy policy? Over 100 staff, ADB staff participated in the survey and we are analyzing, assessing this result and looking at these uh, uh, statistics, I see clearly that uh, the continued support in renewable energy, but also as uh, uh, Priti just mentioned, that energy efficiency should become more and more important. Actually, this is the first few in a way in meeting the demand or making the demand more uh, rational so that uh, we can meet our climate goal. This is very important, but I would like to say that the reason that in the last 10 years, even beyond in the past uh, years, we are not very successful in energy efficiency project, very few success story. Although I can uh, give credit to uh, DG uh, Ken again for the success in India's case uh, with energy efficiency project with EESL, but that example cannot cannot be uh, replicated in many other countries. I think uh, this policy should help us to prepare a framework that push us, help the staff, help the bank in meeting these uh, uh, specific challenges like energy efficiency. In doing so, we should look at not only uh, the, the principle, but also the structure, incentive structure, incentive schemes for staff to work in this. The bank as a, as a bank, we are a development bank, but we're still a bank. A, a bank usually gave credit to large volume. And this is, has not been an exception even for energy sector. We did a great deal and, you know, uh, gave credit to staff for delivering loans, but in energy efficiency, we have to deal with multi-sector, transport, building, in many other sectors, industry, and also we deal with individual consumers. So we have to adjust our way of delivering, uh, supporting DMCs in such projects like energy efficiency, but also distributed renewable energy, any other emerging new technologies would have similar issues that bank has, as a bank has to evolve but also in terms of our, our structure. In delivering energy efficiency project, we have to work with urban, we have to with the transport sector, education sector. So this would require some form of institutional changes in managing project, at least at the project processing level. So uh, I would like to see the policy, would, new policy would not just give a policy direction strategy, but also some specific ways of uh, working together across different sectors in delivering and meeting the challenges mm -hmm. like uh, energy efficiency. Uh, let me come back uh, now to the role of coal power generation. I, I think that uh, I, I would like to mention this uh, in three dimensions. First, there is a policy decision that is up to board of director to agree, approve, on the recommendation as, for example, as recommended by IED, as uh, Alfredo has just also mentioned. I think beyond the policy decision, I think we should also look at uh, uh, economic dimension that 
today, as I already mentioned that uh, the, the solar bid in India is two rupees per kilowatt hour is cheaper than coal. In a pure economic sense, whether it still makes sense to invest in a sector that is already stranded, has no future. So, and this is an important dimension when we look at the future of our operations, uh, specifically for coal, maybe a little bit also for gas, we need a screening criteria to make sure that we are not stranded. But also there is a technology dim dimension. We would like to see whether there are technologies that can effectively decarbonize the sector, knowing that Asia is heavily dependent on fossil fuels. We need to have identify and support credible alternative technologies that can actually take our countries on the path on track toward the low carbon transformation and even for carbon neutrality in future. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Yongping. Thank you. Um, um, we, we heard what you have uh, presented from the overall point of view and conceptual point of view, but these have to be delivered on the ground. And uh, let me then now come back to uh, Kenishi then. You, you, that's your responsibility. One thing is a conceptual work, the policy framework that, uh, that is set up in the institution, but in the end, you have to deliver on the ground. Is there anything that you see that the bank has to change to respond to this transforming sector, energy sector in the region, particularly in your, uh, in your region, South, Southeast Asia region? What key things have to change, if any, in the institution for you to be able to deliver more effectively on this program? Uh, thank you for this very good question for, for me as well as for all the energy sector staff, I would say. Yeah, so I think uh, uh, overall, definitely, I, I, I think uh, lots of changes have to be done. But uh, before going to that, I just would like to, you know, <laughs> make some points on, on, on how we should operate. Uh, actually, uh, you, know, in, in, you know, what the, our experience in India power sector clearly demonstrates is we should be really, you know, get back to kind of a basic that the power sector being a revenue generating. So all the operations needs to be done essentially, I mean, idealistically by the private sector. So our role is really to help the, uh, our counterparts to start attracting private investments to do their own investments. So that uh, we saw now generation sector, conventional generation and the renewable energy, you know, that, that, that has already been done. And our role is more on, you know, uh, making this happen in, say, remaining, say, distribution sector, and also doing more on policy, you know, institutional advice uh, to make that happen. So that's one area that we have been, you know, transforming our sectoral operation. And I, I think our role is really, from that perspective, uh, looking at the uh, kind of latent demand where uh, huge opportunities for private sector exist, but uh, they cannot do at this moment. And uh, there are uh, lots of areas, I would say, in the particularly the climate change, you know, related to, uh, adjustment of the sector itself. So we have been started working, our team has started working into, say, energy efficiency. So there must be some kind of incentive provided to private sector. We have been able to do some, sec some you know, subsectors like, you know, uh, municipal infrastructure, street lights and so on, and then private, you know, LED. But uh, I, I think uh, this also needs to be done in an in a industrial sector. Uh, so this is the area that we wish to see, you know, some kind of financial intermediary, you know, uh, private sector, maybe providing finance, but uh, uh, public sector is uh, providing some incentives and uh, uh, sector regulatory kind of support. And uh, uh, also, uh, you know, newer areas, uh, you know, waste to energy is another area that our team has started to look into. And of course, this uh, needs a very cautious approach in terms of environmental regulations and uh, compliance. Uh, but uh, as Yompin said, uh, this requires a cross-cutting uh, uh, approach of uh, engaging urban. 
So unless and until you know organic waste is uh, provided with good quality, that requires upstream engagement of you know municipalities to do the segregated you know or solid waste uh, management uh, to the to the to the actual you know household level. So uh, those uh, you know cross cutting uh, interventions are there in order for the uh, eventually private investments for waste energy to succeed. So those are areas and uh, other areas we are looking at is uh, solar irrigation. Uh, this can, uh, you know, uh, have dual, meet the dual objective of mitigation, you know, replacing a fossil fuel based generation. But at the same time, solar irrigation can also promote more by replacing, you know, pumped irrigation, uh, you know, more uh, precision kind of water use efficient uh, irrigation. So that can meet the both purposes of, uh, of uh, uh, mitigation and adaptation. Can we help them to, you know, uh, to, to see the big investment happening through our facilitation? So our, uh, you know, agriculture and energy team is looking at it and uh, we have some partnership in Maharashtra to look at that space as well. So those are new areas and uh, definitely, uh, you know, uh, since the, of course, the power sector, the boundary between sovereign and non-sovereign is very much, you know, uh, non-existent uh, becoming in particular uh, upper, uh, some sector. So, so in that sense, we have a, a joint approach of PSOD and us working together. We have one investment in Bangalore uh, where PSOD applies the you know, private sector operational norms and our sovereign side is helping them to uh, you know, implement such a disciplined uh, financial uh, uh, performance management. So those are uh, opportunities we are and uh, looking at and definitely, definitely, you know, we have to have our team of uh, sovereign and non-sovereign team work together and uh, the, the, you know, uh, cross-divisional team has to be, you know, our, our PF division and uh, uh, EN division has to work together on financial intermediary. So there are uh, uh, challenges, but uh, we, we try to, you know, make adjustment uh, uh, of our organizational, you know, arrangements and uh, culture that I think we would like to, you know, you know, use this opportunity of forthcoming, you know, cultural transformation, organizational, you know, reform, you know, RM empowerment. So those are opportunities that we wish we wish to utilize this year. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, DJ Kenishi. Now, now let let let, let me move quickly there are a number of questions that our, our audience is, is posting there that you can take a look at them uh on the chat section uh, that uh, that you can uh, read here um it, but uh, in some of your responses you are already providing an answer to 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 these questions um some of them are quite specific and i'm afraid we may not have a time fascinating interesting questions but let, let me let me uh, come back to Priti. Uh, you provided already some hints of what uh, was not uh, enough uh, in the past. What would you like to see going forward uh, in a future energy program and policy so that the bank is more effective and more efficient in delivering on the climate change uh, commitments. Thank you, Marvin. That's a, that's a, a very broad question. But if wishes were horses, as the saying, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would expect the new energy policy not only uh, you know to to ensure that all our energy sector operations are in alignment uh, with the Paris Agreement, but all ADB operations. And uh, you know, this also um, links to a question which was there in the chat box on uh, referring to EIB and e EBRD pronouncements and what ADB is doing. So uh, like other MDBs, we have uh, made a commitment to align our operations with the Paris Agreement. And this year is uh, very important for us uh, uh, in piloting this initiative. And I'm sure the energy policy would also set us on that on that kind of a course, uh, but again, you know, if wishes were horses, I I, I would um, hope that our new energy policy is uh, 
bold and ambitious, uh, setting us on that path of uh, align aligning with the Paris Agreement. And that means not only on the mitigation goals of two degrees or 1.5 degree temperature increase, but also the adaptation and, and resilience goals. They, these have to be uh, taken in tandem with each other. It cannot be an either or situation. And uh, as Yongping has already referred uh, to, you know, uh, we hope that our investments uh, emanating from, from the new energy policy would not be in stranded assets uh, and stranded assets, uh, not only coal, but also natural gas. And that's where I think our engagement with the country has to take a longer term perspective. Uh, no longer a project by project investment perspective, but a programmatic perspective. And in that programmatic perspective, uh, not only what ADB can do or ADB can do to uh, enthuse the private sector or mobilize the private sector, but what all the other multilateral development banks are doing. And we have some you know, business models for that, uh, maybe on a small basis. Uh, this was through the climate investment uh, funds, uh, you know, where for each country, uh, the MDBs got together and prepared a climate investment plan. So which took a, a, a sector wide view of what are the kind of investments required uh, to, to make a country transit uh, to a more uh, climate, uh, you know, relevant development pathway. So what can ADB do to, to take that programmatic and long term view? Uh, in the context of the Paris Agreement. So that's something uh, one would expect uh, or hope that uh, the new energy policy would set us on course too. Uh, the second is a, a clear enunciation of objectives and principles. And, um, you know, Yongping did refer to them earlier. Uh, but apart from the clear enunciation of these uh, uh, also a hierarchy so that we don't end up doing a little bit of everything. We have scarce resources, but you know, with those resources, uh, we can leverage a lot of influence. So how do we use those scarce resources um, in a more targeted manner rather than doing, you know, um, small portfolios of different, different, different kinds of investments in the energy sector and um, uh, the third one relates to, um, you know, the high level of intent, because normally the policy documents uh, are high level. So that how that high level of intent would really set us on the course for transformational investments. Uh, and it's not only investments, it's also engagement at the strategy level. And there was a question over here, the chat box again, uh, you know, uh, uh, talking specifically about sector uh, regulations and uh, system efficiency, but it's, it's the overall sectoral engagement that we have at the country level. And that links again to one of the recommendations from the IED report, you know, to what extent are we equipped to have that kind of a dialogue with our client countries is important and what kind of capacity do we have uh, so that the energy sector plans are actually decarbonization plans uh, for these countries. And of course, the private sector, the role of the private sector and how we can, you know, seamlessly now uh, build that in uh, such that the our energy policy gives that trigger is uh, very, very important to my mind. So I'll stop here. But uh, thank you. As Yong Ping knows, uh, you know, if the new energy policy could also be the new, uh, you know, climate policy for ADB, that would be wonderful if we see that kind of a merger moving forward. Thank you. Well, precisely on that topic, let me then come back to Iri Pande, right, uh, on the issue of our uh, policy. Iri Pande, what do you expect from a new policy? And, uh, and what, what do you expect from a new program in the region? Mm -hmm. And particularly, what do you think about the role of coal in the bank, not in the region, in mm -hmm. the bank, and as it be and uh, should be reflected in the policy? Thank you very much, Marvin. As uh, I started my first, my response to the first question, I will highlight, of course, that I'm speaking on behalf of my constituency. Uh, because there will be other directors with, who represent very different interests. I will try to integrate some of that into my, into my response. 
my constituency has relatively simple expectations of a new ADB energy policy, very much in line with what uh, Priti has highlighted. Uh, we expect both climate change mitigation and adaptation to be at the core of the strategy. We expect the bank to support a rapid transition to climate resilient, efficient, low carbon energy systems and enabling infrastructure across all DMC. We expect the alignment of ADB's energy investments with this very clunky language, science-based transition pathways in line with Paris Agreement objectives and targets. DMC should receive enhanced support for green and equitable transitions to help them move away from the use of fossil fuels, this decarbonization process that Preeti has highlighted. We expect that ADB and its fellow MDBs will ensure that climate risk, climate resilience, and alignment with Paris Agreement goals are fully accounted for in corporate and operational activities. As a lot of expects, but you asked me. We expect that alignment with Paris will prioritize low carbon energy initiatives, uh, other low carbon activities, and emission reduction technologies, such as carbon capture use or utilization and storage, end use energy efficiency, and climate resilient investments uh, that support DMC's domestic climate change plans. Uh, on the question of coal, uh, Canada is one of the champions of the powering past coal movement. So it will not be a surprise to anyone if I highlight that my capitals expect that I vehemently and aggressively oppose anything to do with coal-fired electricity generation plants or and or projects that sustain or extend the use of existing coal power systems. Uh, we're very pleased with the evaluation's clear call for the bank to formally commit to withdrawing from the financing of new, uh, new added capacity uh, for coal-fired power and heat generation plants, and to make a priority of helping DMCs phase out coal-based energy and mitigate the environmental and health implications and impacts of the existing stock of coal-fired plants. We're also, of course, very supportive of the report's uh, proposal to introduce rigorous screening criteria for investments involving other uh, fossil fuels. If I step back a little bit from the direct bank context and situate the bank in the broader international context, put us into the broader ecosystem of IFIs and international agreements, ADB energy policy will be in the spotlight at COP26 later this year it would be a major reputational risk, and that's being polite, for ADB to go into COP with an energy policy that still allows coal and heavily polluting fossil fuels to be supported, even if the bank has a de facto moratorium. I think that the, it's important to note that other MDBs, uh, even our friends at the AIIB, uh, which is not necessarily known for being the most climate friendly of institutions, have adopted more progressive policies. I think this, this starts to bind the bank. I don't believe that we can be a climate rebel in this context. And I certainly hope that the bank will do what is necessary in order to, be, to play a leading and ambitious role in the ramp up to COP26. Now, just to highlight that I'm not trying to be uh, a Pollyanna just saying, oh, well, wouldn't it be nice? I, I, I note that the issue of a formal ban on the financing of coal projects uh, is quite a challenging one in the context of the board. And I would make reference simply to the DEC discussion of the energy evaluation uh, that took place last year where board members expressed a wide range of views on this very topic. And as the saying goes, uh, you know, where you stand on an issue typically and often is based on where you sit. You've got energy suppliers and power plant builders and financiers seeing their interests as being based on a lengthy transition period, which uh, I would uh, term something perhaps like the St. Augustine approach, which is, oh Lord, give me chastity, just not yet. Um, and DMCs, Looking at their, looking practically at their existing stock, their existing resource complement, 
their existing infrastructure uh, investments and wondering quite realistically how they can afford to make the transition to the green low carbon future uh, that we all want. There's clearly a role for the bank in helping DMCs make this leap, but it will require perhaps more leadership and clarity of thought than has been evident um, across the last, uh, well, the period under review for the evaluation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yuri Pandey. Very, very clear, uh, very clear statement and, 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 and thinking and position of uh, your constituency. Um, friends, colleagues, unfortunately time uh, is up now. Uh, we've gone a little bit, a few minutes beyond what we were uh, planning. Um, and uh, so uh, we have to let it go here. Uh, this is just the start of an important conversation for the institution and for the region. Uh, I'm not going to summarize here uh, what we have said or the, what the panelists have said, but evidently there is pride in what the bank has done over the last uh, 10 years. The bank has contributed to the transformation of the energy sector in the region and the view of all the panelists, something that is also reaffirmed by the evaluation. The, energy policy has played its role, but going forward, we have heard it from all the panelists. There are the important challenges and there are changes that need to be made in the region, uh, the, both on the way that the bank operates and more importantly, uh, on uh, with respect to the policy. A lot of our expectations we heard very strong words, uh, both from a board member and uh, from uh, management and experts in this field. Let's continue with this conversation. We thank you all for being with us and let's uh, give the panelists a very, very uh, strong round of applause for their contribution uh, and their thoughts. Thank you all so very much. Have a great remaining of your day.